Hi, I'm Kate Wogley. Uh, I am here representing the School of Art and Design at the University of Oregon. Uh, and we have been working for quite a while to get our tonight's speaker here to meet and talk to all of you. Um, the Curator and Critic Tour, which this lecture is a part of, started in 2011 as a partnership between the University of Oregon and the Ford Family Foundation. It was a modest proposal to research and connect Oregon artists with curators representing many current conversations in contemporary art. When we started to put this program together, we couldn't have imagined the breadth and depth of experience visitors would bring to artists throughout the state and the new understandings of what's happening here that these artists would bring to those visitors. That said, the tour is just one of seven visionary elements of the Ford Family Foundation Visual Arts Ecology Program. To explain more about how all of that works, we're privileged to have with us tonight the Ford Family Foundation representative who really guides this constellation of in initiatives with exceptional intelligence, care, and generosity. She's Candace Brewer Nunn, Senior Advisor to the Visual Arts Program for the Visual Arts at the Foundation. Candace is going to say a few words. Could have been better seated, I think. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming out on a wet, dark night in Oregon, and special uh, thanks to Jan Vervoort for coming all the way from Berlin to join us for the next week or more. Uh, we, uh, as Kate mentioned, this was one of seven elements to a um, a, a constellation, as it's a good word to use, of uh, resources that we wanted to apply to help bolster the creative practices for artists in the region, as well as arts institutions that are in place to exhibit and preserve their work for future generations. And m many of you are probably familiar with uh, the Halley Ford Fellowships. We have several fellows in the, office, uh, in the um, audience here this evening. Raise your hands, please. That, that's, a, that's a really wonderful uh, acknowledgement of your work. Uh, the Curator Critic Tour program, while it doesn't um, have the largest budget of all of our seven elements, is certainly one that has really, really uh, returned, an invest, uh, returned on the investment. The value has been significant, and the tremendous um, appreciation that people who come to visit our region have about our artists is something that has blossomed over time, uh, but our artists have certainly um, enjoyed uh, the perspective that they can bring to their practices in the one-on-one -on -one studio visits. So those, that's an extremely critical element of the program. And then branching out from that, uh, we are doing more to bolster in the area of critical writing, uh, which has been very important. It's been a loss over the last six to eight years uh, with the economy, and so we're looking to find other ways and other avenues to get that voice out there. The other elements are the career opportunity grants. We also provide funding for art acquisition of significant works by Oregon visual artists. And uh, we also have a fairly robust exhibition and documentation program and small capital improvement projects for museums and for galleries that exhibit Oregon um, contemporary visual arts. Uh, with that in mind, I'd turn it back to Kate. Uh, she's just been an incredible partner in this whole process. And I, I do also want to acknowledge that um, since that time, we've also broadened out our partners. And we have a number of other institutions that have been hosting visitors with us uh, over the past several years, uh, including uh, PNCA, the Oregon College of Art and Craft, uh, the Cooley Gallery at, at Reed at Portland State University. Um, it's just been a wonderful group, and they continue to be kind of a brain trust that we, that we collaborate with uh, going forward. So uh, I want to thank them also for their assistance over the last couple of years. Thank you. So I'm going to cover some of that ground again, because before we introduce Jan, I want to thank the Portland Art Museum, uh, Sarah Krajewski, who is the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, 
who is right there. And Stephanie Parrish, the Associate Director of Education and Public Programs. Stephanie, are you here? She's back there. For their enthusiastic and generous partnership on this lecture. I also want to point out the four partner institutions that have so enriched the whole project since 2015. The Cooley Gallery at Reed College, Stephanie Snyder is down front here, always. Uh, Pacific Northwest College of Art, Mac McFarland is back there, and Ashley Gibson. Uh, Oregon College of, Arts and of Art and Craft, Denise Mullen. Denise, are you here? Denise? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, and Portland State University, Sue Taylor is not here tonight because she has whatever everybody else has. Yes, for Portland State. So, after six years, 16 visitors from throughout the country, and nearly 200 studio visits, I have the pleasure of introducing our very first international visitor, Jan Vervoort. Vervoort is a critic and a writer on contemporary art and cultural theory based in Berlin. He teaches at the Piet Zwart Institute in Rotterdam. He is a professor for theory at the Oslo National Academy of the Arts and a guest professor at the UDK Graduate School in Berlin. The author of numerous books, journals, essays, and anthologies. But more importantly for this audience, and paraphrasing a description of his book, Cookie, Vervoort addresses the forces at the heart of the tragic comedy that making, showing, and critiquing art implicates us all in. He honors the basic joys of turning one thing into another and the miracles of rhythm and rhyme that characterize magic in art. About criticism, he makes visible the endless emotional labor of setting the stage for others and gestures toward and ethics of disappointment, to battle false expectations, and as a way to come to terms with the fact that, no matter how you look at it, criticism hurts. Please join me in welcoming Jan Vervoort. Hey, thank you so much for this super kind introduction. And Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I always feel super happy when I get an invitation like that because it, it always somehow comes unexpected. You know, it, it feels like it's the strangest thing about being a writer that you send out these writings and at first it seems like you're sending them out into the void. You're just typing them out and sending them somewhere and then maybe some years later someone calls you up from a place that you always wanted to go, like Portland. <laughs> Actually, really, yes. Uh, and then you, you come here, and I, I still find it, it's, it's um, what I can I say, the pleasure, the privilege is mine to, to, in the moment when someone opens the get, uh, in, in a studio door and says, come in, this is my work, this is my life, this is what I'm doing, and I think it's, it's the greatest form of hospitality, so thank you. And especially, Kate, thank you for putting up with my strange communication habits. I've, I think I've, I've, I've by now I acquired an inability to do things over email and we did a lot of things over phone and that very much helped, thank you. <laughs> um, um, I want to make three quick remarks about um, regarding the, the talk tonight. First thing is I uh, only got over here from Berlin two days ago so my body still thinks it's three in the morning right now, so if at any point I should stare into space uh, or start chatting too enthusiastically, please imagine that we are in a bar at three in the morning and there's kind of very loud music that kind of evens that out, then uh, we're on the same page. Um, secondly, I, I like to talk about I'd like to use talks as a medium to speak about things of which I'm not entirely sure how to address them yet. And that's why I'm very grateful to what people say in the Q&A afterwards, and I try to learn from that. I did a test 
uh, of this lecture kind of a couple of weeks ago in Berlin and try to learn from what came out of the discussion afterwards. So I hugely changed things, which means unfortunately I lost the public voices on the way because I, it, it, let's say it's, got, it's gotten more implicit because I realized that throwing a term like fate around requires a lot more explicit uh, explanations. So I'm gonna, I, I felt like a lot of things that I didn't manage to say or I, that occurred to me I hadn't said in the previous talk, I'm gonna try to get the way to the question of the politics of fate a little bit more kind of explicitly paved out today and try to talk a little bit more about what an aesthetics of the fateful could be uh, when it's not just uh, exploited by the right, but maybe reimagined by the left. So, so um, public voice is implicit, but therefore a lot more on the question of fate. Uh, um, the third thing is, I, I'm never too sure whether anybody needs an art critic to address politics, but it feels like at this present moment in time, you cannot not talk about politics. Uh, I'm gonna try to sort of add what I can say based on my experience. Um, usually I like to keep things implicit and speak through images, but I have a feeling right now there's many reasons to be, to be very explicit. So the first part of my talk, unlike my usual presentations, will be very wordy. And then in the third part, I'm gonna get visual. So that, that's just as a basic introduction. Usually I come in three parts. Um, First, I want to talk a little bit about um, politics, or just very basic sense of urban politics, uh, and, and try to understand politics as a, as a game that people play. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to raise the question whether this game is actually still on, or whether at the moment we, we face a situation where the, the possibility to play politics has been fundamentally called into question. So, which leaves us with the question, can we, can we bring politics back? Can we get the game back on? So that's the first part. Um, do you actually write attractors with two T? Is that, does that look right? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in the second part, I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, something which will get us to the question of the fateful, namely, I'm, I'm trying to think that a blind spot in the way how we usually think about and criticize ideology is that um, we usually assume that ideology, ideologies do the talking themselves. When I think maybe certain developments force us, force us to acknowledge that ideologies need external attractors things that kind of add the oomph, the attraction, the kind of the, the pull, the magnetism to an ideology, which is usually difficult to address because it's implicit to their rhetorics, something that creates a kind of a buzz uh, around uh, a particular kind of language. And I'm trying to say that maybe right now there is a certain attraction to the idea of a people's fate or a, a fateful attraction, if you will. So I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about that. And um, my, my suspicion is that, uh, that the right wing is very, at least where I come from, is very good at mobilizing an idea of a kind of a fateful, fatefully, bound, like a community that is bound together by fate. And my question would be how can the left, can the left reimagine this idea of a bond of fate? Which leads me to the third part, um, which is almost like reimagining the mafia, which is one traditional, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of the mafia and this idea of um, corruption as an existential state of being torn together which is literally the translation of corruption. We find ourselves faithfully entangled, torn together, and can we, can we reimagine that from a, from a left-wing perspective? So these are the three steps that I'm gonna try to go through. Yeah. Um, 
Thinking about politics, I'm, I'm sometimes stunned by how abstract the definitions of politics get, especially in art, when on a certain very mundane level, the moment that you, I don't know, work as an artist with, with, with curators or that you end up at a, at a university, you constantly find yourself entangled in the mundane side of, of politics. And then um, you suddenly realize that politics might simply be the art or the practice of mediating between conflicting interpretations of a situation at hand. So you have a conflict uh, and you need to somehow figure out uh, how to, to entertain uh, different perspectives on the same on the same problem. So different parties propose different narratives of how the given situation should be read. Uh, and this could be a crisis at the university. Uh, how do we look at it? What perspectives are there around the table? How can we bring them together? Or it might just be the, which for me is that, let's say, like an originary situation of politics, that when you're going out with friends and you ask the, 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 the terrible question, so where, where do you guys want to go for dinner tonight? And so you have kind of conflicting desires and, and interpretations of how that situation should best be resolved. And then you have to not just negotiate these different conflicting interpretations, but somehow find a way of entertaining these interpretations in a way that you don't split the community of those people who sit around the table. It's, 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 it's a very pragmatic, mundane situation, but it, um, it, it teaches you a little bit about how politics and power are related. On, on, a, on a very basic level, it seems that if po politics is the art of negotiation, of, of entertaining these different interpretations, power play happens the moment uh, when the struggle over who is to say what is what becomes tangible. Um, especially when in, in an antagonistic situation where the, the outcome, uh, the, the resolution of the conflict, uh, has a lot to do with which interpretation actually wins. Like some people say, ah, a situation at a university that I experienced, oh, something's going wrong, uh, there's so many international visitors coming in and they're so arrogant, they just come in and out with their trolley bags, I don't know, we don't know, we don't know what's going on, and then you happen to be one of those guys with a trolley bag, and so uh, you're faced by the power of those in the house who say what is what, meaning that you are one of the international intruders, and then you have to use your powers of language to pr pr produce a competing narrative, to say like, yeah, uh, I, I, I may not be here nine to five, but it doesn't mean that I'm not respecting you. Listen, I'm actually bringing in experience from without, and. You, try, you have two, two parties describing the same situation. Undeniably, you, you hear the sound of the trolley bags in the background. But um, so which, who is to say what is what? And in that moment, of course, uh, power gets negotiated because the, it's not only the better story that wins, but the person who, who presents a particular narrative will then have the power to decide how uh, the policies at the university will be, will be, will be negotiated. So, um, and in that moment you realize um, ideology in politics is precisely the story that you tell that gives you the power to say what is what. Ideology is a compellingly simple account of what is what, which is very easy to repeat. Uh, who are you to come in here with your trolley bag? Are you a foreigner that takes the jobs away? Or are you actually, and now what's the other story? Bringing in experience, uh, making sure that the pensions are gonna be paid for society that gets older. So it's, it's competing narratives. And on that level, um, yes, ideologies become these power tools that allow you to tell a story that may explain what is what that gives you the power to steer things uh, in your way. And on that level, um, 
maybe we are all involved in producing ideologies the moment that from, I don't know, from a relationship fight to a political situation, we'd come up with a story that gives a, 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 our version of what is what. And uh, usually the story wins that's the most easy to repeat. And right now, again, the right wing seems to have offered a lot of images and stories that are very easy to repeat. And uh, if, if one consults someone like, like Gramsci and, and the notion of a fight over hegemony, then obviously um, one would be challenged to provide stories or come up with stories that can kind of uh, uh, override the existing narratives and that are probably powerful in the moment that they can be repeated or we repeat them uh, in such a manner that they get a, a certain purchase on what passes as reality. So on a certain level, um, I guess also from, from, I don't know, from the news to children's books to art criticism, it, it might all be part of the same kind of uh, political battle over which narrative uh, can and will be repeated from lecturing, like which artist do you bring in, uh, how do you reshape the canon as a, as, a, as a narrative that is repeated. On this level, I, I, I used to think that I want to steer clear of all everything that smells of ideology. Um, I think after recent political experiences, I, I, I feel more like giving the Gramsciists more respect and say like, yes, if it's about conflicting stories, there might be a necessity to, to repeat certain images, certain stories that compete with those that are currently kind of defining uh, the hegemonial narrative. So this is just a... how in... in, in, in recently I've, I felt like to, to make sense of terms like politics, power and ideology and, and their relationship. Um, Another side of ide I I ideology, of course, is that it talks to the imagination. Um, and in that sense, that ideology is a powerful tool to make people imagine what is possible and what is impossible. So that uh, if a nation is told to imagine certain impossibilities, those impossibilities become realities in the same way that obviously that uh, the repetition of a certain narrative can render ideas of the possible realities because suddenly you see that it's you 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 believe that in the repetition these things are rendered possible and then they they will be most likely um, but all of that thinking about it is still presupposing that we haven't left the arena of politics yet so that if we use powerful tools like stories and images to somehow turn the tables and uh, win over uh, the, 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 your opponents, that this is still part of a discussion that uh, the different parties share, uh, where, where the two parties that might be battling over the power to say what is what still consent, uh, consensually arrive at, at, at a sense that of the game being on, we're playing politics, I'm trying to convince you, you're trying to convince me that this story describes the situation. And as the game is on, there is a basic commitment that, we, that both parties are in it. Yeah. Um, so that if we use tools and weapons like ideologies, um, it's within the game only uh, and which means that they're not actually tools of war because war is bracketed and temporarily suspended. Um, recently, I don't know what the situation is here, but in, 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 in Germany there were quite a number of reports of po politicians being attacked in their villages or in their communities and politicians felt the need to, 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 to appear on the news and say like, listen people, but you do understand that even though we're in different political parties, we don't actually hate each other. Yeah? This is just the game. We, 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 of course we are at each other's throats within the game, but after that we go and have a beer because that game is called politics. 
and it felt like there is a renewed need in a moment of total radicalization and division to make it clear to people that what, what politics is, that it is a game where the power tools like ideology are being used, but it is within a game that different parties consent to play, uh, premised on the idea that they're all bound by the fact that, yes, they're in the game together, and even if there's a kind of a, a battle over power, it is within the game, so there is a platform, a common ground that people share, not absolute division, and that common ground is the game of politics. In the same way that one could actually say that's one thing that politics has in common with commerce, urban conflict, eroticism, or whatever you call chutzpah or blani, um, I think I had an Irish student who told me that that is only Americans who say blani, true Irish say talking shite. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's the, the idea that you actually find yourself in a situation where the game is on and that game might be a night at the pub where you talk shite and, it's, and you try to keep it up as long as possible. Or uh, commerce where it's totally clear that I try to cheat you, you try to cheat me and Let's see how it works out today, tomorrow it might be different. But it's, we are still in the same game. Or something like urban conflict, where it's like it's totally clear, we, I don't know, the urban, the urban game of New York, I'm rude to you, you're rude to me, which means we're all New Yorkers. Something like that. Yeah. Works in a similar way in Berlin. But it, um, where it's, it's quite clear that conflict, commerce and politics understood as a game actually create the very platform that forms a city. So that it has a common humor, a common understanding that the game is on and you're all in it. If you are in New York traffic, of course you're going to be rude to each other because everybody knows the game is on. Yeah. Um, and so war is suspended because that doesn't mean there's no conflict. That just means there's a city that lives and breathes a polis through its politics, uh, which is an, like an understanding of a certain kind of game that you play with each other and that may be most enjoyable when it's most provocative. So hence the, the, the notion of chutzpah, you're trying to, call, to bring the other out of their comfort zone, bring them in the game, feel them, feel their energy. And that is, um, I'm, I guess I'm paraphrasing what Chantal Mouffe already said in the 90s, that there is a translation of the, the agonal, of the constant fight of the war between families into the sphere, into the game of politics where it becomes antagonism where it's bracketed and suspended because everybody knows the game is on and you're in it. Yeah? So a, a very basic existential understanding of the games that people play and that includes politics, commerce, flirtation, uh, conflict. Um, the only problem is that these games, it seems, are usually, they are an inexhaustible resource. People trade and people fight. That's a city. Like, I give you something that's mine and, you know, you want to have this, can I have this of you? And then maybe we can also have a little fight over it and, or tell each other stories. This is something, this is, this is a machine that's running all the time. So, and since it's almost like a perpetual mobile of urban life, um, of course, it's, it's, it offers itself to exploitation. And I'm not entirely sure how thought through this is what I'm going to try to say now. But I, I feel in recent years, I, I feel like it's very urgent to make an, a difference between capitalism and commerce. Because if, if one assumes that trade and capitalism are the same thing, it's like saying the butcher and the cow are the same thing. Like trade is the cow, it lives, it breathes, and yeah, well the butcher or the farmer is the person who exploits the cow. So capitalism is a way of trying to make sure that out of the general trade of everyone with everyone, some people reap the benefits rather than others. Um, but this is only the mild version of, of, of capitalism that thrives on exploiting trade. There is, I think, an even more vicious version that understands that what's even more profitable than trade is urban conflict. If we understand that this game is on, yes, people in the city fight. That's, that's part of uh, how, how we live together. Conflict is, is a joy, it's a resource. Um, unfortunately, it's even more profitable to exploit conflict than trade. 
And I had this one experience of a, um, a senior student in Oslo who was um, uh, called Rara Omazat from Kabul in Afghanistan. And he talked, he talked about uh, life in Kabul and said, you know, it's, the problem is not just the, the Taliban. The problem is the people who sell the Kalashnikov to the Taliban. Yeah, the, the conflict, the unrest is always somewhere there, but it's not like Kalashnikovs grow on trees. Yeah? Someone puts them into that zone to arm and fuel the conflict to actually reap the benefits of the conflict. And I've, I somehow I, I've never forgotten that conversation to say like, yes, it's true. You can, you can try to reap the benefits of a city trading, but if you have a city fighting, of course you can reap enormous benefits by, by selling more and more arms to that conflict. It's just you milk, after you've done milking the cow, you butcher it. And I think we live in a current situation where, where capital tries to milk and butcher the cow but at the, at the very same time, where, where the question, why are there so many weapons? Yes, because urban conflict is an inexhaustible resource that you tap by arming and fueling it and reaping the benefits of that. Uh, um, to the point then, of course, you, 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 after, you've done, after you're done milking the city, you, you get even more money out of it by fueling its conflicts until the city falls apart completely. Uh, um, um, and it's the bizarre thing of, of capitalism, one of these ironies or absurdities that it doesn't hide anything, that it's the, the, the truth is usually just so profanely obvious. So, um, and it, but it feels like right now the irony is that we can't even be sure that capitalism still exists because traditionally capitalism would have relied so much on exploiting trade that by now it's, when, it's, when it's actually exploiting conflict more than trade, um, we've reached a point where maybe the game is over, the game that it, capitalism has been exploiting, and we're transitioning into a post-capitalist era, which is actually, I don't know, you could call it high-octane feudalism. A friend of mine from, from Lithuania, he, he, looking at Russia, he calls it turbo-tsarism. It's, it's, a, it's a new system where the exploitation of high-energy resources such as oil and the conflict around it has reached a new level where we're actually moving back uh, uh, to, to an almost feudalist situation where you don't even need commerce or free trade, free trade anymore. You're shutting that down because exploiting conflict is actually far more profitable. Um, that's the one thing. And the other bizarre thing is um, like maybe in an age of capitalism without commerce, we end up being players without a game or kind of existential gladiators, if you will. And if you think about it, if the game is so much about like everybody getting a certain share of the deck, that's a city that plays where everybody, where the deck is shared out and everybody has a few cards, so we're playing. And it feels like the brutality of the situation right now is where we're pretending that we're still playing a game, but in fact, the, the deck has disappeared. Like, let's, let's imagine I, I, I play cards with three friends and I give each friend one card. Uh, I keep the rest of the deck to myself and actually stash most of the deck away offshore. Uh, yeah. and, and so we're playing, we're, we're pretending that the game is still on, but the deck is not even on the table anymore. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's not just saying that there's the, the top 1% that have all the wealth. No, they're, they're taking the money, they're taking the deck off the table. Um, which is a bizarre situation um, because not only is the game no longer on, but the desperation of those who still want to make sure that they're in the game is even bigger because you have just one card. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, my card is my voice, my, my vocabulary, but I have a feeling that looking at the, what in other words could be called pre precariousness or precarity, is precisely that situation where you have one card 
uh, you know, that it's, you're either going to be the next Harry Potter or you're out of the game. Yeah? It's, like, it's like you don't even, you don't have any choices, any, any cards to play with. You're running around with one card desperately. It's like, am I going to be the next one or not? Do you want to have that card? Please, can I check on Facebook how much my card is currently worth? Yeah? So it feels like um, as players without a game, when, because the deck has disappeared from the game, uh, it's... It's, uh, yeah, we're the one card players, and it actually means like we're urban gladiators with, with, without a game. Kind of just checking each other's status on Facebook saying like, oh, I wish I had that card. Yeah, even though everyone's just got one card. Yeah, and maybe that's, that's the depressing situation of the moment. And I, I remember a conversation at a curatorial program where, where people were saying, yeah, I mean, the current, it's just a regime of jealousy where everybody's sta staring at each other's one card, not knowing exactly what it is and what it means, but just trying to figure out, okay, if that person is there with that card, how can I get there too? Or even more brutal, someone said, you know, the biggest fear is to be stuck with second best. Yeah? Like, I have this one card, that card may be better, I don't, I don't even know. Yeah? But just in case, I, can we change? Yeah? Um, and maybe that's the, that's the de de depressing thing at the moment as a cultural agent, where it's our precariousness lies in the desperation of being stuck with the one card that we def def desperately want to put in the game, but just the game is gone, because the deck has disappeared somehow offshore. Yeah? The, the deck is in the Cayman Islands. Yeah? Um, <laughs> So the big question for me is, can we bring the game back on? Like, if that card deck is disappeared, is there any way culturally that we can say, like, you know what, we don't need that deck. Actually, we need to put a new currency in the game and just put a new deck on the table and say, like, urban game is back on. Yeah? Uh, and it's maybe not called capitalism. It's maybe like we, it's another form of commerce, another form of conflict that allows for the game, the common ground of people actually having a proper fight on the street. Yeah. And not saying like, you're over there, you're over there, I'm not even talking to you anymore. Yeah. Um, I had, had this strange moment on, on in being in Miami where my partner was on a residency, looking out of the, the, the residency building which was on the gentrified side of the street and everybody there was white and sipping cappuccinos and on the other side of the street everybody was black and homeless and on drugs and there was a police car parked in the middle making sure that people from the one side of the street don't go over to the other side of the street where you feel like there is no game, there is no society, there's just two guards on the side of the street each with a card. It's not happening. Yeah. So how, how can we get the game back on? Yeah. That's, that's the question and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a ridiculous proposition um, which is to reimagine urban conflict, to say like how can how can we actually have a fight with each other? Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to call it convivial rudeness. Uh, we're gonna get to that in a moment. I, I had I'm, I hope I'm not romanticizing this, but it's it's been a very strong memory. I I, I was working in Tel Aviv at one point for a bit, and I have this memory of of being in in Jaffa, which is the the Arab part of, um, yeah, it's not a part of Tel Aviv, it's the, the neighboring city. And there is a, dis a textile, a, a traditional textile district between Tel Aviv and Jaffa, which is called Florentine, and traffic there is horrible. And so we were sitting there one day um, eating and like watching the horrible traffic, and suddenly I saw this, this old guy, like probably in his 70s, riding out into heavy traffic with one of these bikes that they use there, with, filled with these rolls of textiles, going right into busy traffic, not looking left, not looking right, with this attitude, you and your cars. Me and my, me, me and my textiles have been around for like, I don't know, hundreds of more years than your stupid cars, I'm not even looking at you. <laughs> Which then obviously ended up, uh, provoked kind of a concerto of, of angry honking from all sides, whereupon the guy, with, in the most dignified manner imaginable, started blessing everybody. <laughs> and I just realized the new fuck you is the bless, bless you. And it, it, was, it was entirely unclear which of the two locally available divinities he was invoking. Yeah? But it was, um, it was kind of on a higher level that he brought the game on. 
say, this, this is Tel Aviv, what are you talking about? This is Jaffa, like I'm riding my bike here, this is the game, so bless you all. <laughs> I, I once told that story in Chicago, uh, where um, uh, a student with an Asian background then told me a story from, from, from the audience and said, like, her grandfather in the States never learned to speak English, and whenever he, he had to pass immigration, he would just look at the immigration officer and just shout, hallelujah. And whereupon the, the, the off, every officer would go, like, amen. <laughs> and it's... Um, like people like Slavoj Žižek and Badiou, they talk about strategic universalism. I, I don't like that word. I'm just thinking like bringing the game back on is appealing to a higher sense of humor, be that the hallelujah or the kind of the universal screw you being like, bless you all. Yeah? So, and it's a utopia. Could, could that be imaginable? So, like, there is a peace process in the Middle East. Could it be just, hey, bless you all, I'm riding my bike into heavy, heavy traffic. And it's, after all, that's what our city is about. Yeah? And the other day I was, I was uh, listening to, to, Col to Colbert uh, to commenting on this recent event and basically saying, yeah, but what does it mean? Like in, in, in New York it just means welcome to the city. Yeah? Why, would you, why would you be in traffic if not for the pleasure of flicking other people off? Which reminded me of a story that a Iranian student uh, Runak Moshtagi once told me that she said, you know, if you want to learn to drive in Tehran, it's mandatory to learn cursing. It comes with a driving license. That's, you know, that's the joy of being in urban traffic is to know how to curse. This is exactly what, for want of a better word, I would call like convivial rudeness. Yeah. This is a way of bringing the game back on. Uh, the, the, the common pleasure, the vernacular pleasure of, of uh, rudeness in traffic, um, or I could call it the, the wisdom of the urban grotesque. Like the body, the body, the body articulates itself through profanities, but that fundamentally means we share the fate of being in the city. We're stuck in the same traffic together, and that just means we, we can express the fact that that is the game that we're in uh, through the grotesque, whatever grotesque expression your vulgar imagination allows you <laughs> to come up with. Yeah? So um, I don't, I, I have a feeling that preaching peace is not an issue, it's even the even higher utopia would be, can we reimagine conflict on a level where we're actually not just on two different sides of the street, but in the same traffic together and enjoying it in the most vulgar possible way. Which I do realize is something that is not easy because when conflict turns back into war, and there is actually something like a civic war raging across the nation, certain abilities to, to make jokes about the other may be irretrievably lost. I'm, I'm painfully aware of the fact, for instance, that being German, um, I understand now having been in Tel Aviv, probably for the longest time was about Jews and Germans living together in a way that was based on the fact that we're both terrible dickheads yeah? and that there were kind of forms of expressing that by making jokes about each other, which of course is after the historical atrocities and disasters of the 20th century, for me now, is it, it leaves me speechless. I have so many Jewish colleagues and friends who can make amazing jokes, which I am in no position to tell you. Yeah? Um, even the jokes that, that came up when I, when I was getting on a guilt trip trying to say, I'm so sorry, I want to make amends. The only thing I would get back in proper black Jewish humor would just be dirty jokes about my, 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 uh, my kind of blue helmet, let's be friends here. When it's like, this is not what it's about. But unfortunately, I'm no, in, no, in no position to tell these jokes. In the same way that in a maybe racially divided country, like... <laughs> There is this inherent awkwardness about fighting out a conflict through being telling rude jokes about each other, which would be the most most desirable condition. But the moment that we're back on the level of war, you you might see it in the moment that it's impossible to tell a rude joke 
about the other, which is why I think Seth Meyers uh, is is amazing. Uh, when they on 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 the, on the comedy program br brought up this this sketch called "Jokes That Seth Can't Tell," uh, which I'm sure you all know it, which usually ends up like with his two colleagues telling the the black and the queer jokes. And then they, in the end, they get him to tell a joke, which is kind of off, and then they both look at him, and he goes like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel this is kind of urban humor in the States, which I Im admire Im incredibly, trying to even straddle the impossibility to tell the joke of the other, and, and turn that into an urban situation where the city develops a humor that even deals with the impossibility to tell the other's joke. So I think this is where it's at, and um, if there's hope, it's probably in, in, in this utopia of convivial rudeness, I would propose. First proposition. <clears throat> Second, and this is already an attempt to talk about fate. No, what's, what's about, what, what is the fate of being citizens of a city together? Well, it's, stu it's, it's about being stuck in traffic together and, and enjoying that fateful connection through rude humor. Second attempt to, to approach similar questions. Um, fateful attractors of and beyond ideology. On the one hand, yes, ideologies are compelling the moment that they are simple and easy to repeat. Um, at the same time, as I was trying to say in the beginning, there is usually some something, an emotional force, a force that attracts you, something charismatic, some, some kind of thing that connects you to the feeling of a lived presence, that sense that, oh my God, this person who sent, tells you the story is connecting to something that you kind of existentially experience. Um, and I would like to call that an attractor. Like something that, that actually makes the work work, something that makes the words work, that kind of open up the channel between the speaker and the listener. Um, something that makes a discourse feel like relevant, that makes you feel like, oh yeah, this is about me. Yeah. And um, I would like to call it an attractor. And I have a feeling that, strangely enough, we inherit a battle of attractors between the left and the right, if I can use these kind of very kind of schematic terms, that almost dates back to the beginning of the last century, where a basic attractor that the different political factions use to connect their discourse to, the, to that sense of living your life, living through this, being in lifetime somehow together, that these attractors to make it crudely simple, um, have been two very different discourses, which both of which relate to the idea of lifetime, living the time of your life, finding an answer to the question, why, what are we doing as we live this life together, as we are in existential time together? The left creates an attraction around progress, Okay, this is oversimplified, but uh, progress, whereas the, 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 the conservatives traditionally oppose the narrative, the attraction of progress with the attraction of fate, as far as I see it. Uh, it's both, it's interpret like what happens as we get older, what happens as time passes by in our lives, how are we to interpret that, what is the narrative, but what draws us emotionally into this narrative, on the one hand might be a notion of progress, on the other hand might be a notion of fate, my, my suspicion. Yeah. And I don't know, yesterday morning I woke up early being jet lagged, switched on the news and saw, saw the great news of the, 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 the um, election sw swung towards the Democrats, but a typical example of the discourse of progress immediately came out of, um, what's his name, Murphy from New Jersey, he, getting onto the podium and saying, uh, we are better than this meaning there is progress, this is bad, we can be better, yes, we can. It's, it's, it's a rhetoric, the attraction is that of progress, yeah. um, which is, is the discourse of the left. Yes, we can use or our, our, we can find a reasonable solution, we can improve, we can be better than this. 
We can be so much better than this. Um, it's a strong rhetoric of empowerment, but unfortunately it has the kind of uh, drawback that anybody who doesn't feel addressed by this rhetoric immediately feels worse than this. So if you're not talking to me, if I'm not, I don't even have access to the discourse of improvement because I can't send my, my kid to an expensive school in New York, uh, obviously I'm, I'm worse. I'm, I'm unimprovable. I'm uh, deplorable. I am, I am not, I'm not going to be uh, 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 privy to this situation of improvement. So what am I then? What, what, what am I then as this little shit, this kind of indivisible remainder, this leftover, um, this piece of life that is excluded from the discourse of improvement? Who, who is going to talk to me existentially when I feel I, I have no possibility whatsoever to enter this discourse of improvement? And the only thing that this discourse does is make me feel like I'm, I'm, I'm lacking something. I'm found wanting. Um, and that is unfortunately... Uh, where, where the fate discourse kicks in because it appeals exactly through this, uh, to this idea like beyond any horizon of improvement we are all fucked in this together yeah, or like in a more polite way I could say we are doomed in this together yeah? so um, it's, it's exactly the counter discourse um, to, uh, to the idea of improvement and progress. It's an idea of, you know, we live and die together. This is our fate. And, uh, and this fate becomes, conjoins us, even and especially in the moment when we lack. Uh, which is kind of strangely enough why people who can embody this discourse, they're not necessarily strong. Because like to embody this, this, this idea of like, you know, we share one thing, we are doomed, we are screwed in this together, it actually helps when, when you're actually a little bit of a freaky character. I mean, like in my, in my country, like Hitler is not a, a strong, he doesn't embody strength. He's a hysterical guy with a mustache who's barking into a microphone. I mean, Charlie Chaplin got that right. It's, 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 it's easy, it's rather an embodiment of male hysteria than, than strength which made him instantly electable to like working class people like my grandfathers who after the first world war were totally screwed, had nowhere to go and felt like, okay, I'm worth nothing. In the moment that you have a freaky persona who embodies that, that sense of, of a non-progress uh, situation, of course you can connect to that in the same way I would assume and I don't want to ex explain to Amer America to Americans, but, but the, 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 the sense of somebody, no one can be fooled by, by someone like Donald Trump. He's, he's, he's attractive on the level of being just so freaky, of being exactly the kind of useless white man whose demise is imminent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In the same way that... <laughs> that um, my, my partner is from Italy and living through these Berlusconi years, Berlusconi, like you, you make someone the president who boasts that he's cheating on taxes, like everyone actually does, and feels so much relief that finally someone says this, I am as bad as you. Yeah? So that's a strange kind of, this connection of fate, when progress says we can be better, very stressful, aspirational, and the counter discourse, no, I'm as bad as you. Just absolutely, oh, oh my God, what a relief. Yeah. Um, so I get picked up from where I am. I don't even need to kind of force myself in a position where I want to be. Yeah, on that level, this is actually fate as corruption. It tears you together on the level of I'm actually as bad as you. Oh my God, what a relief. Yeah. Um, and thinking about it, unfortunately, this idea of, of the fateful connection has a long tradition at least in my country, in, in, in a philosophy that actually foregrounds the doomed, the death drive, as that which brings us together and which, I'm not an expert at the old right discourse, but I feel it's a, it's a figure of thought that keeps returning right now, which is this, this idea that, you know, every people has their own fate. And my death is not your death. I'm not a racist, I'm just, I'm just gonna say like, you know, white people die differently. Yeah, this kind of idea of separatism that um, 
Everybody has, every people has their own fate and they need to live their own fate. Hence, we need to divide society because fate sets us apart. Because we each, each of us is doomed in a very particular own way. Um, if you trace it back to the philosophy of the turn of the century, just after the turn of the century, it's curious to see how some of the ultra-conservative thinkers that paved the way for Hitler and were then actually also thrown out by Hitler because he didn't need them anymore after they paved the way for him, provided a lot of the vocabulary that keeps coming back into today's discourses. I don't know how it's over here, but there's a lot of talk of the fateful in, 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 in Europe. Every election is called fateful, and uh, um, the new right in Germany, they, they say, you know, Merkel, she's the, the chancellor of the others meaning the liberal elites, and she is not sharing our fate. She is one of these trolley bag people who kind of does business with the others, the liberal elites, or the, uh, the postmodern uprooted intelligentsia, uh, but we need someone who shares a fate with us. And that finally actually means who shares our, our sense of being doomed. Because we don't actually want the trade that makes the nation stronger. No, we want to actually withdraw into isolationism, which would be doom. But we prefer that doom together rather than a yes, we can. Wir schaffen das, we can do it. That kind of puts us in a position where we don't know exactly where that's going to go. Yeah. So, um, strangely enough, a lot of that thinking, that fateful coherence has, has a lot to do with kind of enjoying the prospect of going through doom towards your doom together, like death together is preferable to a life of insecurities, is something that you find very strong in writers, for instance, like Oswald Spengler, and Untergang des Abendlandes, the demise of the West, decline of the West, yeah? um, who has a kind of a strange organicist uh, uh, understanding of cultures, very popular in, at, at the time, where, where the idea is like each culture has its own life, like a plant or an organism, so it grows, reaches its kind of pivotal blossom and then goes into a cycle of decline, uh, which is just organic. So each culture needs to go through these loops um, and uh, it fulfills itself through its own death. And that is actually its history. So a lot of kind of historicism that found its way also in, in the art history that, that's still being spread is this idea of like, you know, a culture that blossoms like a plant and then collapses again and finds its completion in, in, uh, in a certain rhythm that implies its own demise as part of its natural cycle. Um, while on the one hand Spengler compares different cultures, he supplies the one argument of the ultra-conservative uh, that is like each culture needs to die its death alone. Like a German death is different from a British death. The English, they have all these modern things like journalism, parliamentarism, everything like the, the, the fake news and already during that time, it's like that's for British people, they, like the Germans need to die a different way. Yeah. And the French, also the French, they, they're okay, but we need to die our own death, um, which is a, a thought which then is also very strongly echoed by Heidegger in already in, in, um, in uh, Being and Time, where, where he, he, um, he brings the idea of Geschick, Geschichte, history and fate together with the idea of Volk, of a people. Like every people is thrown together in being and in this moment of entanglement of being thrown together, they need to realize their own fate um, through a particular form of resoluteness. So like fate is just something that potentially exists in Heidegger, it's not like Spengler where it automatically happens, but it's just the potential that you re have to realize. Um, so a little bit of German. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the whole idea is that the only way how you can claim your fate is, uh, is through in the most resolute way, embracing your own death as a potential. This is this whole morbid spin on existentialism that then in the 60s had everybody chain smoking with black turtlenecks. Yeah. It's like, Sherry, I have to die my own death. Uh, yeah. uh, um, this, this whole of thing, like unfortunately it comes from a moment when to realize fate 
to turn fate from a potential into a reality, it needs the hero who in a resoluteness consigns, consecrates his life to a future death and from that point can retroactively write history. Like the those who are resolute enough to embrace their own death acquire the, po the possibility to write the history uh, of their people. So in that, in that moment you have a nationalistic macho death cult basically, as an interpretation of fate. And I would say as, the, as, as probably the backbone of a lot of ultra-conservative thinking. Patriarchal, moribund, uh, existential, which is, the, which is the problem because usually there's so much talk about that kind of fateful discourse as being irrational or emotional. I, I don't think it is. It's just very existential. It just answers, interprets the ex existential attraction of like this is really about my, 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 my life and how I'm going to live and die. What's the Metallica quote? My, my lifestyle equals my death style, my die style? Something like that. Yeah? It's just, oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm, this, this is really about kind of making carpe diem, making my life mine. Um, and it is that et existential attractor of death and resoluteness that translates into a people's fate, that Heidegger was actually also, it's already in being and time, and it's basically the, the theme that he's riffing on in his notorious acceptance speech when the Nazis courted him and made him the dean of the Freiburg University, where that readiness for death that consigns a people to its organic fate, of course it needs a Führer. Uh, and then this Entschlossenheit, this kind of resoluteness, is embodied by the hero who makes everyone ready for death and has them marching, marching all the way to Russia. Yeah? Um, so it's, it's, it's where you realize that this militarized, macho death cult aesthetics, unfortunately, is very much at the heart of this kind of fateful consecration as aesthetics that is, 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 is very key to, to a certain kind of existential legacy. And if I think about the, my, my grandfather's, like this is my, my, my grandfather, working class baker boy. Um, he, was, he, he did have, he had, he had no time to be irrational. He was actually quite rational because he was working day and night. He just tried to bring things together, which is not an excuse. Yeah? But obviously he was attracted to this idea of like a consecrating his fate to at least something definite, which is, which is death. Yeah? And, uh, and these are the, he's, um, he's the other baker boy he, um, wearing the uniform. Um, my aunt, who you see in the middle, she made she had the family archive and made sure that whatever you see on the arm there was kind of uh, covered by pencil marks. Uh, it cost her her sanity. She ended up being manic depressive. But it, um, where you realize this is a working class ready to consecrate, to kind of grip its own fate. Like uh, his best friend, I don't know, he didn't last too long, I think like one month into the war and it was over. And when my grandfather came back, the city that in which he hoped to embrace his fate, I mean, the city was gone. Yeah, so no bakeries, everything. Um, and th this is the moment when you realize that a, yeah, a, a conservative attractor is just like, what shall I do with my life? Yes, I can consecrate it to a common fate. And um, this is where you end in a kind of outright war. And they got sold to an industry that uh, made its money out of pumping, lo pumping out lots of steel. Um, that's what happened. Uh, just hope it's not happening again. Um, so on this level, I feel on the one hand, it, it seems like if you describe it like that, the attraction of the faithful um, is so difficult to beat because it, it has a kind of doomy, doomy, gloomy attraction of kind of let's go back to coal. That thing is over, it's dead. Yeah? You're consigning yourself to the doom of your own classes, to someone who's obviously going to rip you off. Why would a poor man vote for the rich if not? Because at least that rich person can give him a first first-hand experience of what it means to be screwed. Yeah? Rather than having to think about that in abstract term, you, you, get, you get very close in touch 
with all the forces that screw up your life. Like Hitler sold the working class to the German industries, but it, feel, it probably felt like by voting for him, they at least had a purchase on their own demise. Uh, that, that's this kind of strange, the attraction of like, if I'm gonna be screwed anyhow, let's at least, let, let me at least have a purchase on that attraction. How can one possibly battle that attraction? Uh, obviously, the, the person preaching progress always has weaker cards, has a weaker purchase on the existential than the person who, who preaches, preaches the, 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 the death drive of the existential. I'm not sure whether I can come up with a way out of, out of this. Yeah? But um, having spent a lot of time in the south of Italy, thanks to my, my partner who's from Calabria, Federica Buetti, I, I had to somehow familiarize myself a little bit with the history of the Mafia because uh, it's unavoidable. And uh, it's actually there that I kind of first felt like I'm, I'm forced to think about fate because the maf Mafias, Mafios, the Mafia is so much about the fateful connection. Yeah. L let me just first make it worse and then let me, let me, let me try to get out of it. Yeah. Um, if, if you... If you um, if you read about the history of the Mafia in Sicily and there's conflicting accounts, a lot of it actually comes back to the question, why would the, the dispossessed actually embrace the forces that dispossess them? How is that even possible? Yeah. And the history of the Mafia gives a, it gives a pretty clear account of that. It's namely, um, okay, I'm going to be bad at this, and this is much more complicated, but again, simple story, I'm sorry. Um, in Sicily, at, at the end of the, the 19th century, the, the, the local landed gentry or aristocracy had already been massively disempowered. They had lost a lot of their fortune. So the, the local leadership, the leadership that was accepted as credible because they were part of the same stock, if you will, uh, they had been drastically weakened. And I mean, no one tells that story better than Visconti in Il Gatto Pardo, where it's quite clear that, it, yes, you're poor, you're rich, but fundamentally you're part of the same, you're, you're who, hewn out of the same Sicilian rock, if you will. But that, that structure had been weakened right in the moment when um, so-called liberator Garibaldi from the north came and tried to reunify uh, Italy, together with a kind of yes we can kind of slogan to say like, you shall be freed from feudalism, finally, and we're going to give you a republic. It's going to be progress, you're going to be so free and everybody can do what they want, you're, just, you're citizens now, isn't that great? You can be so much better. Uh, only the problem was like when he overran Sicily to reunify the country, everybody down there, I mean they didn't even speak the same language basically knowing how different the dialects are. For them, it's just somebody from the north who you can't understand properly tells you you are free now and you're going to be part of a system of which you have no idea how it's going to work and how you would even belong to that. Meaning the fateful connection is obviously completely absent from this relation. It's just somebody p promising you that you're going to be free and emancipated citizens, but the only thing that you feel, it's, it's, a, it's an invasion of northerners. Yeah? We don't know what they're talking about. They come here with their trolley bags or boats and they're out back to Rome the next day. Like, what does that have to do with us? So, like, this new discourse of the republic, the nation, obviously lacked basic credibility because it, it, there were also no translators to, to establish these new powers in Sicily or in the south to somehow render this new regime tangible or credible. And the great idea that um, people had was like, if, we, if we, need, we need some kind of law keepers that somehow establish the credibility of the new order, why, why don't we just hire the local thugs? Yeah. They seem to know about crime because they're, they're, they're in it. So um, let's just g gather up a few of the local gangs and make them the police, yeah. which actually worked in the sense that the devil, you know, is, is, is more, more, more uh, acceptable than the devil you fear because you have no idea what they're about. So strangely enough, in order to create a credibility around power, um, the, the, the local 
forces, local crime, had to be put into the place of establishing the new order, which meant that people got used to kind of at least feeling they were dispossessed on, on close quarters. They were in touch with the logic of their own dispossession because you get, you get ripped off by your own people, which seems still more acceptable than getting ripped off by someone from the north who you can't even understand. Which, um, if you want, and this is a stupid play upon words, if that the discourse of the modernizers of progress and citizenship is an interruption of your family ties, you need to put that which is interrupted back together and that is a co-ruption. Yeah? So after an interruption you get a co-ruption which establishes, re-establishes the semblance of the original bond. And again I think, um, sorry again, yeah, um, the, the strange thing only is um, that the semblance of the original bond um, still displaces the original bond. The mafia gives you a semblance of aristocracy, but which is a kind of a second-hand aristocracy. So it tries to replace a bond that has been interrupted and sealed over again, and, uh, but in that moment it creates kind of second, second-hand royalty, if you will. And in that sense, a particular sense of aping the style of the aristocracy to suggest that you can tap into an original fateful bond through a particular aesthetics, which I would call the empire of the tacky. Yeah. So the, um, the, the new high-octane feudalism, is, is, it, it's marked by the same aesthetics that you would find in Sicilian mafia. It's the empire of the tacky because that particular tackiness suggests a, a past that maybe never happened. It suggests the res restoration of a fateful bond uh, that is particularly convincing because everybody kind of knows that it's not what you lost, but it's still better than what you get promised. Yeah? So hence, it is precisely this kind of um, cheap Baroque that, for instance, if you follow the, 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 the TV series Gomorrah, there's a lot, of, a lot about this kind of golden sofa. I remember someone telling me, well, that sofa gets more golden from episode to episode. Yeah. It's the glow of the second-hand bond that seemingly rest restores the fateful connection. Um, yeah, that's the sofa. Uh, that's the clan around the sofa, and you kind of know what that is. Yeah? So I think if we read it aesthetically, um, uh, this is th this is in New York. This is the oligarch version in 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 Moscow. No, it's not even. Did anyone meddle in the election? No, it's the same model of governance. Yeah, it's the empire of the tacky. It promises a kind of Liberace version of of a fateful connection that's particularly strong as an attractor, because everybody can simultaneously see through it, and at the same time embrace it. Yeah. It, it has the particular glow of the surrogate, if you will. Um, it, is, it is kind of camp on a certain level, and precisely because of that, it allows you to mourn the loss as much and as engage in the, in, in the delusion. Yes, we all know Father Christmas doesn't exist, but oh my God, he's bringing the presents. Yeah. So it's, it's precisely on that level that, that everything that also already Spengler was invoking as never existing, the organic connection of a history that is all floral and growing. Of course, it's, it's in this new kind of mafia baroque that uh, that vision finds itself realized. Yeah? And um, so I'm going to try, try to get to a last run, and now I'm trying to get more visual. Um, can we, is that kind of empire of the tacky that suggests the fateful connection and is so convincing precisely because it is so trashy? Uh, um, can that be can that be rivaled or reimagined by by the left? The problem is, um, or you could call that kind of corruption also the existential grotesque, that it's it's so existentially appealing because it's so tacky, it's so trashy, and that if you feel like you're trash yourself, of course that tacky trashy thing that it talks to you about your life, uh, um, and I have a feeling. Strangely enough, when I, when I look at the history of, of my country, the, there used to be a, um, a left that, that talked corruption, where you had a particular 
credibility of left-wing politicians because they were attractively, obviously corrupt and hence electable. And these are the, the, the kind of the patriarchs of the post-war area, like these kind of chains, in, in, I mean, this is, this is Willy Brandt, the uh, leader of the Social Democrat Party together with Helmut Schmidt, like these chain-smoking uh, chain smoking guys, um, maybe not coincidentally here with, with Mr. Kennedy, like the playboy, uh, who know he's kind of he's kind of one of the good guys, but he's also not promising you to be better because everybody can see that he's actually as bad as you. So the person who talks about kind of making it better is still acceptable as a man of the people because he's kind of obviously cheating on his wife and and is involved in the same kind of bad games of life that everybody finds themselves in. Yeah? But strangely enough, like with Brandt, getting this credibility also made him kind of be the person who, who, who could go off script and for instance in this historical incident in Warsaw kneel in front of the statue of the unknown soldier which he was actually really not supposed to do so he went rogue on that and, and did these gestures. At the same time however you can see here it's like our, our president as the Marlboro man um, and, and afterwards all these stories came out about that of course he had, had, had the escort service on speed dial. Yeah? And everything that I guess until Bill Clinton passed as a particular form of uh, asset to a masculinity that even on the left could show that they're part of the same existential grotesque, the same corruption while actually promising improvement. Yeah? So. Um, I, I see that in a whole generation also of, of curators or in public TV in Germany, there's a whole generation of public broadcasting directors who actually funded um, kind of experimental movies and very progressive stuff, but there were all these guys yeah, um, who were kind of untouchable because they were actually really kind of godfathers of the left, yeah? like intimidatingly mafiesque. And uh, at some point, of course, for very good reason, these patriarchs had to go. Yeah? And I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I'm trying to say here, but it, it feels like the left has a problem now because the question is, can we depatriarchize the ex existential grotesque? When these figures, these chain-smoking sexy leftists, in all their macho demeanor, could work it both ways, promising improvement while actually making people feel like, yeah, actually I'm as bad as you are. Um, so this kind of underdog, rock star, dirty boy talks about progress, that they could have it both ways in, in a way that of course is quintessentially unbearably patriarchal. Yeah? So I feel in terms of rechanging the imagination, probably the strongest images that we have at the moment is actually Game of Thrones. Yeah? Because they, they're reimagining female leadership, like they're matriarchizing corruption. To say, like, can we imagine a female leader who is credible because she is also bad? Yeah? And again, I, I think the biggest, I mean, like, in the same way, no, I, can I say that the chance probably of Hillary Clinton would have been to be the, the Khaleesi of, of the Democrats? Yeah? had there been a firmly established discourse that the female leader can also be bad. Yeah, don't talk about demons, uh, don't, you don't talk about emails, she's got dragons. Yeah. Um, and so I think if, if it's, it's a strange challenge of the imagination right now, when we understand that credibility is to some extent also linked to sharing the possibility of being bad. Can, can we imagine the female leader who, who will improve the situation, get over the patriarchy that is definitely over, but with a credibility that includes the possibility of being badass. Yeah? As, um, and in that sense, I think one cannot underestimate the imagination that something like Game of Thrones is, is currently developing. Yeah? Um, on the other hand, going back to another tradition, I feel like this is still a man's voice, but maybe a queer voice. When, when you look at the, the leftist discourse of someone like, like, uh, like Fassbinder, this, these are stills from Fear Eats the Soul, Angst, Essen, Seele auf, which is deeply, deeply fatalistic on a certain way. It's so much about fate. He, uh, he, um, he copied, now the jet lag kicks in because the name, 
uh, what's the, what's the American director that this is based on? Hmm? Um, Rock Hudson and and now Rock Hudson, the the thing where he sees the, he's the lumberjack bohemian and uh, super cheesy movie, but about the yeah, yeah, Douglas Sirk. Yeah, exactly. Kind of Fassbinder trying to get the melodrama of Douglas Sirk translated into a gritty existential surrounding where it's really like it's, it's the dive bar existentialism that still gets um, an Arab guy in Germany together with an aging widow. And they, they find themselves totally coincidentally in a fateful situation that binds them together against all odds, against everyone around them, trying to, trying to divide them. It's, 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 it's a strong vision of a shared fate that is shared against all odds, but has a, has a particular kind of, it speaks the mafia baroque, if you will. There is, the, Fassbinder actually speaks the existential trashy, like fluently and precisely because he has this kind of dive bar fatalism, he can, he can develop a, a, an alternative vision of, of cohabitation in a city where um, race and class uh, 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 play no role anymore because people share the fate of the dive bar in an aesthetics that has this particular kind of yeah, mafia baroque to it. Yeah. If I were to translate that to the, maybe this is a bad translation, but I keep thinking about someone like MIA and kind of doing the kind of Gulf state, Gulf state trashy baroque in, in the feminist style. This is from the clip, Bad, Bad Girls Do It Well, um, where, where you, you feel this is someone who, who speaks mafia baroque fluently, but, but twists gives another spin on the fate, on the conditions of the fate that could hence be shared. So um, in the same way, and another queer filmmaker, if you think about someone like Pasolini after the war, who, who speaks the language of corruption fluently, but on the level of um, still understanding a kind of a working class Faithfulness. And if, if I understand my partner well, it, it, Pasolini would have been somebody who everybody in Italy watched. Yeah? So I'm not, obviously I'm dreaming Gramsci's dream that I mentioned in the beginning of, the, of, the, of, of getting back some kind of purchase on the, the common imagination. But um, thinking about it, it might have to, about be about reimagining the corruption of the city that brings us together and speaking the existentially trashy, as for instance also Pasolini does in Mama Roma, this beautiful film where people are really screwed in this together. But what there is a kind of a hardcore optimism, a vitality that is uh, not a bond with death and being doomed, but out of being kind of screwed and doomed together, creates an amazing vivacity. It's, it's a kind of uh, a corruption of life, not of death, that is embodied by, by, by um, Mama Roma, if you will. Now I'm getting nostalgic, uh, but uh, I have a feeling if there's anything to rival the existential trashy of the left, maybe we do have a a positive tradition on that side. And if someone like MIA is, is to be trusted, that stuff is also alive and fluently spoken. Maybe the imagination could also be invested in speaking that language of the existentially trashy, corrupt, baroque, but with a particular spin, not towards the death cult, the, the patriarchal macho death cult, but to a kind of Khaleesi style, dragonesque um, corruption of life, if you will. That's my last proposal, and thank you for your patience. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I want to push back a little bit. I'm really troubled um, yeah. by the idea that 
our avenue to a, a future Sorry. might be to all become fluent in, in trashy grotesque. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have plenty of grotesque with Roy Moore and people like that running for office right now. So we yeah. don't even need more trashy grotesque. But what I didn't hear in your, in your talk that I think is another avenue to think about is what I heard you saying was we don't uh, have any of us have any cards anymore which is to say people don't have jobs. People don't have jobs yeah. that they feel that they can ground their identity in and all the deck is off in the Cayman Islands um, in uh, tax protected trusts. And so if that were brought back, that would fund a lot of infrastructure work and jobs. So I feel as though work is the, and, and it's interesting because you're showing a lot of art, which would be work of a certain sort, so I feel as though that's the sort of unstated term that hasn't been brought up would be, can we reimagine work mm. as a, a way to, pe to ground people's identity so that there could be a surplus, which could be a little bit of trashiness, why not? But that people's identity and their sense of their destiny could be bound in one's idea that I have a job to do, which is feeding my family and helps my community and I can ground my identity in that, and then I don't have to vote for Hitler. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're totally right. Obviously, I'm... And I, I'm not entirely sure if that's a... a luxurious position to take, but on the one hand, yes, the moment that you, you try to, 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 to create a, a workable politics in a moment of crisis, one needs to be pragmatic. One, one needs to make it work. Uh, I, I completely agree with that. And in pol political negotiations, obviously, it's so much about like, how can we make this work? All I'm saying is that I have a feeling on a very existential level that there is a particular kind of bond that is created in moments when people feel like, oh shit, it might not work. And if it, does, if it doesn't, are you still going to be with me? Uh, where, where a solidarity in the moment of the possibility of total failure is actually profound and necessary to acknowledge the p potential of total failure together as a counterweight to a, a, a pragmatic and pedagogical discourse of making it work. I, I know from kind of teaching performance workshops and stuff that there is a moment, of course, where you, when you have this macro society in a state of crisis, yes, of course, you have to, you want to make it work. But there is a moment when you can only get the trust or a particular kind of quality, a deep quality of a community when you go to total crisis and you don't patch over the crisis, but um, really feel with people like, oh my God, this is totally falling apart right now. And in that moment, I think that the trust that is build is, is very deep. It's like, okay, I'm in this mess with you and I'm not trying to claim the higher ground here of someone who's just going to go, go, go coordinate it. Fully well knowing that in, in moments, in certain moments, coordination and improvement is just like people need to get a better life. Of course, you need to get the thing together. But um, I'm just thinking that sometimes in the act of being the pragmatic organizer for the, for the better, one shouldn't underestimate what it means to just pause for a moment and say like I, I feel you in the moment where this is actually just feels like a total tragedy it's like being with friends or when they're in trouble it's usually like I don't know I think it's a male disease when you go like oh this can this problem can be easily solved there's a total rational solution to this and actually your friend or partner just wanted to complain it's like, this feels so bad, and don't tell me like we can find a rational... I know that there's a rational solution. I just, for a moment, I wanted to feel your proximity, that you're with me when I'm actually in despair. And the moment I'm proposing solutions, I've missed the opportunity to, to make somebody feel like I'm actually with you, and this is totally horrible. And then half an hour later, you can maybe say, yeah, but maybe we can let's go have a day of dinner, and just, I don't know. Yeah. But it... It seems like ped ped emotionally, politically, pedagogically, I, I think sharing the crisis existentially is one thing and proposing a solution is another. 
and maybe the credibility that allows you to then pull through with the solution to some extent comes from sharing sharing the crisis uh, and and then on the other when it comes to like let's say aspiration like pop culture or pop art is so much about the aspirational like okay this is hot i want to have this uh, talking to desire through a particular aesthetics and um, of course there's a desire of good taste yes wouldn't we all want to live in kind of zen modernist building with mid-century uh, modernist furniture. I resisted it for a very long time. Yes, then I got it too. I, I lived in Oslo for a while and then walked home with all that Scandinavian furniture. Yes, of course. Yeah. There is a sense of kind of rational, uh, like this, this promise of, yes, we can make this better, which is so much alive and a lot of modernist good taste. Um, when at the same time this, this sense of, oh my God, where am I in this? What is this city? Well, you find that in the dive bar, where everybody who survived the, the night until four in the morning or five or whatever it is, uh, finds themselves in the same kind of sinkhole. And there is something about this, the equivalent of sharing the crisis, being in a sense of like, what I can only describe as this kind of existential camp or existential tacky or existential bad taste. Um, I don't want to equate the kind of sharing the crisis, that moment of empathy, with kind of being fluent in, in, uh, in, 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 in a certain kind of trashy style, but I do feel there is a certain kind of connection to a kind of, I don't want to even call it working class, but the Someone, someone like like Edouard Glissant calls it the, the global baroque, and he looks at, at at Latin America for that sort of um, kind of a fatefully messy aesthetics, if you will. Like I don't know, I I, I just want to propose it as a if there's a narrative of social improvement and pragmatism, making it work, finding the better solution, absolutely without alternative, in the same way that I think certain kind of modernist thoughts. Have, have an undeniable attractiveness, completely. But when it comes to, to this level of existential solidarity, this sharing the crisis, I would still want to make a claim for this kind of, this, this dirty pop sensitivity. Um, yeah. So first I want to thank you for bringing, uh, focusing on politics. So uh, how do you explain the same group of people who voted for Obama, Barack Obama's mm -hmm. progressive message of hope, you might have touched on it with empathy, mm -hmm. that then turned around and voted for the current situation. Yeah. So how do you explain that? I mean, my, my only, again, I, I mean, you're in a much better position to, to think about it being in this country. I can, something that I draw on is, is my experience, let's say, as a pedagogue or, or teacher. When, when, you, when you realize at some point you can attract people to the notion of like, okay, let's raise, let's raise the stakes, let's keep our standards high, yes, we can, we can do it, we can all think this together, we can push it up there. Um, but then there's, there's, there can be this situation of alienation in the classroom where you realize that you're just pushing too hard and you're losing half of your constituency because they, they feel that they lack access to that message uh, of improvement. So like, you want me to be better? Am I not good enough? Like, this is when the liberal leftist pedagogue becomes unbearable because he's in the, in the moment of promising improvement, actually just telling people they're not good enough. There's something to be found wanting. Like where a lack that could be a desire then suddenly backfires and you feel like, is there anything wrong with me or why do you want to improve me? Yeah. I think that's the that's an experience that that I struggle with. Yeah? Like to, to when when you when you raise the stakes, how can you, in the moment when you try to raise a desire, how can you not make people feel that there's something wanting with them? And um, I, in in past talks, I very often I, I I got back to the Sesame Street, and I feel like there's one shouldn't underestimate the genius of Jim Henson. Or these, these, these dialogues between Cookie Monster and, and Kermit, hence the 
stupid book title, Cookie. I, I think no one got that, but it, um, <laughs> but it, um, because the beautiful thing about that is that you have an educational program that has a ridiculous teacher, a kind of hyperactive frog, face someone who's positively unteachable, or in other words, the deplorable cookie monster, who just wants to eat cookie. Yeah, and so in that moment, you you have you teach. But one character is the unteachable, who constantly throws the, the desperate frog into relief as, as, um, as, as, as the ridiculousness of the teacher who wants to explain something to you when actually you want to have cookie. Yeah. Um, and I think that the 60s, 1960s generation totally understood the ridiculousness of the, of the, the leftist progressive teacher while actually being in that position. And that, on a certain level, you can make that discourse credible by also understanding the joy of being utterly unteachable and having, having both as these dynamics, uh, in, and that's why it's funny and, and credible. Like you can't have Kermit without Cookie Monster. Uh, that, that would be, that's a, it's a, I think that's the, and I, I feel the moment that you push the Kermit, you lose the Cookie Monster and then you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, that's one, my, my classroom experience. Uh, the other, um, God, I had it a second ago. Um, I, I, again, drawing on my own experiences, I don't know to what extent explains something. The, the problem that the, the old right designates by talking about, I don't know, the liberal elites, the moment when, when the left is obviously begotted. Yeah. And I, I, um, I have that so much in my own professional life that for me that this freedom and liberation and the opening up of Europe meant that I got the hell out of Germany. I was so happy traveling all over and um, felt, okay, this, this is liberation, this is progress, this is fantastic. I, don't, I can bypass all the national hierarchies. I don't have to care about this. This is freedom, everybody talking to each other. And then suddenly you, sudden you find yourself in the position of being the guy with the trolley bag rolling into a local art school, for instance, in Norway, and you think you're, you're bringing progress and all they see is someone bringing neoliberalism. Yeah? Meaning a unleashed high performance creature who jumps off a plane, does some performance workshop, and obviously doesn't share the local fate. He's not going to kill or marry anybody there because he's not even going to partake in the deep-rooted conflicts, which I don't even understand why everybody in the village hates. Like, because I'm on the next plane out. Yeah? So in that moment, I realize in the eyes of many, I become the monster that I actually believe I'm fighting. And in that moment, the... Uh, I feel there is something about this kind of urban liberal elite that cannot even sustain their own kind of hyper ambitious existence anymore that becomes a caricature of those who feel that they can ditch fate because they can always get their kid to a better school and, and when everybody else dies they're going to be on the plane out to the next place. Yeah? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying from my own perspective the moment when the, the promise of the left becomes unbelievable because when they say progress, everybody just sees a liberal urban elite who raises the pressure for everyone. I'm, there is something about that where um, it's sometimes so strange that the right has, has, a, has, a, has a kind of a certain analysis in these moments. Obviously, the conclusions that they then arrive at are the same old death drive thing. But to say, like, when do I become a monster? And what does that mean? For me, that raises the question of credibility again. No? Um, can I credibly speak if I'm the guy who falls out of a plane and clearly makes it clear that he's not going to share the fate of the people there and just going to be out in a second? Uh, the whole question of of the, the liberal urban elite being in it, the so-called cathedral, how, what does that mean? Uh, how can one renegotiate the politics of that? Uh, obviously, when you're not in a position to spend the next three years hanging out in the local dive bar um, to establish credibility, but who do you end up talking with in the school or the workplace, or where is that moment when you get out of this kind of bubble and that by default when ends up in by being a precarious high performer. Yeah. 
So I think that's a bit of a dilemma where I feel like the, the, the credibility of a certain progressive narrative has been seriously endangered because in, inadvertently, involuntarily, you're indistinguishable from the avant-garde or the stormtroopers of neoliberalism. And um, I don't know, I just see that, that as a problem that needs some thinking and acting and empathy in kind of sharing a crisis, which doesn't fully explain the, the swing. But it, for me, it's just this question, are you still with us or promising a progress that means that you're going to be on the next plane out? Yeah. There was a moment where you described the in Sicily up the play of two words and uh, interruption and corruption. Yeah. And um, it, when you brought that up, I don't know if this is exactly a question, but when you brought that up, uh, I actually thought of the Obama to Trump swing. Yeah. And that if one could look at things in sort of a superficial sort of way, uh, Obama was sort of an interruption of the status quo yeah. uh, in the United States. And I think may perhaps... Um, some of the um, uh, sort of um, rejection of some of the optimism that perhaps he hoped to bring about in terms of ending um, um, the kind of um, the discourse that was so uh, um, divisive mm -hmm. in terms of trying to bring people together, that in the end, the status quo overcame the optimism. And I yeah. think perhaps that causes the pendulum where people go back to the corruption. Let's if tear will. it, if it's torn apart, let's tear it back together. Yeah? It's weird, no? On the one hand, it feels like one, one shouldn't underestimate the brutality of the modern promise. Like that, that progress radically interrupts. I mean, like, I think the, the progressive thinking in, in Germany of the, of the 1950s and 60s is post-war in the moment when the country doesn't exist anymore. And after that brutal interruption, people in that moment, they went for, for some narrative of, of progress and cosmopolitanism at some point. So, um, is there a basis for embracing like a modern idea of progress that you feel like you've gone through that thing and now you want something better, but the sense we can be so much better has an existential purchase on your life because you feel like it can't possibly get any worse. So of course we want something better. Um, I don't know. Or in the moment when, when you feel there's a wound of modern, modernization that you've been overstretched but it's, it's like explaining these things always sounds like, like one is excusing them. And of course they're all unexcusable. Yeah. Um, that mafia is unexcusable, it's an unexcusable violence. Yeah. Um, it's just the moment when, when a community tears itself back together and acknowledges a certain degree of badness. Yeah. I mean, maybe I talk a little bit as a, as a Nietzschean terrible word, but I think there's something beautiful about Nietzsche when, when he speaks about kind of pessimist optimism. To say like we can only be optimist from the position of being totally pessimist. Yeah? And that's that's a genius move because he outmaneuvers, he outmaneuvers the, the monopoly that the conservatives have on pessimism. Like Thomas Hobbes, like you know, like everyone is everyone else's wolf pessimism. Hence we need a strong state and a patriarch where pessimism is the foundation of the conservative argument has always been. And with Nietzsche, he goes from kind of saying, yes, we are all terrible. Or like I think there's a Jonas Mikas movie when, when he goes like, people are bad. <laughs> people are bad. And, and but where you, from the deepest possible pessimism, you go into a certain kind of exuberance. Um, and I have a feeling that that gets me back to a where the wound that, that, that the wound that is the social, like the conflict, now people are not nice and we don't need program, we, progress because we're all gonna be better, we're gonna be as bad in traffic as the day before. Yeah. But based on that badness or the acknowledgement, can one arrive at a certain kind of exuberance, yeah. like an optimism that doesn't over, like we're not gonna get better, probably we're gonna be the same unbearable creatures that we always were, but based on that, <laughs> Is there a, an exuberance that I wanted to get at with the kind of um, corruption of vulgarity in, in city traffic? 
like bad jokes that and make you enjoy the, 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 your, your condition of sharing a polis, the politics, in, in an exuberance that is based on black humor, if you will. That, that is another way how I would propose a co corruption of life rather than one of you know, going for, for something that actually maybe never happened, a, a, a past that you cannot resurrect because it never actually existed. Um, sorry, I'm losing my, my thread here, but um, hey, thanks for your Thank patience. You. <laughs>